So this is a quick uh, piano tutorial on this prelude by Rachmaninoff. And of course it begins with the famous three notes. And then it continues from there. What's quite interesting is that despite there being no indication except for accents and fortissimo, there is still a shape to this phrase. In fact, if we listen to Rachmaninoff's very old recording from something like 1919, I think it was. Uh, let me just find it real quick. <laughs> Of course, another funny thing that we hear is that he does not hold it for four beats, that whole note. It's roughly three beats. You can count yourself if you want. I'll leave the link to this video in the description. But there is a very clear... ...connection between these three notes, and that connection continues throughout this opening, and we'll just spend this tutorial on the first page, the lento, um, the pianissimo that you see in measure three, or I guess complete measure two, could suggest that we are to play the melody notes very quietly now, but that's uh, far, far from the truth, because you get this effect. Well, actually, let me just show you what Rachmaninoff does. So, obviously, he brings out that melody. It's no longer fortissimo, but it's definitely not pianissimo. Pianissimo applies to these, which are also shaped melodically, so they're not just quiet notes, kind of very nebulous and uh, imprecise, but in fact you hear, let me go back up a little bit, there's the long note, and now... so just that a little bit of rubato to really create a phrase from these three chords. Mm. I'm not even playing it as well as he does, so one of the h hard things about these three um, well, six-note chords, three in each hand, is the ability to bring out the top voice. Now, how do you do that? Because right, these are the six fingers we have to shape. Now, if my goal is to bring any one of those notes out, then I have to control whichever finger, in this case the top finger, uh, such that I can bring it out while in the same time controlling the other five fingers so that they don't impede upon that top finger. So it's that and that. And to connect uh, those attacks precisely together, I find what can help to practice this is to prepare your hand in position, just like you see me do, right, like this. I, I don't think there is a good way to arrange your hands for this chord. Uh, I think this is the best way. So my right hand is inside the keys. And then what I do is I play the top C sharp. And I try to find the sound that's just right. My next job is to focus and bring down the five other notes. 
Now that in itself is tricky to do them so quietly that every single note sounds but none of them sounds too loud. So just working on one hand could be helpful, the right hand. Right, so we're working on paying attention to one type of sound, the top note, and then we're paying attention to the other notes and making sure that they are quite quite a bit below dynamically. So this is me working on this by playing the first note loudly and then taking time to mentally prepare and strike the quiet notes just right. Another way to practice, strike the quiet notes first. So this ability to strike with one dynamic and then with a different dynamic is very important for a lot of pieces. Of course, since it's written such that you have to play exactly together, this is just practice. The idea is that eventually you can do this. Right? So you're taking a little less time when separating the quiet notes from the loud note, or let's say the loud note from the quiet notes. Soon enough, your brain can have such a quick switch that you can basically play all three notes together and still have the control of the top finger playing louder and those other notes being played quieter. It takes some time if you find it difficult at first, but just practice separating like I'm showing. Well, of course, also the left hand. You can separate notes so that each finger plays by itself and you have full control. You can start bringing some notes together. No, not so quiet. Right? And too loud. That's nice. But what's important is when you're practicing this finger control, you stay in the right position. It's not good to kind of play like this. Each note separate from the rest. Be able to do this, but now simply work on individual fingers. Taking time to learn this kind of control. Anyway, let's say we've skipped through this kind of practice and now we're able to shape these bell-like six-note pianissimo chords, but with the top note slightly more That D sharp might be a problem because I think I have slightly uneven voicing uh, there, but whatever it is, you find this shape and it makes sense, but then What's interesting also about Rachmaninoff's playing right there is that there is a kind of slight diminuendo from the louder A and slightly softer G sharp and then finally coming down to the bottom C sharp. Let's, let, let's listen one more time. So every time he gives this melody shape, and because it's this shape is filled in with these bell-like chords, you really have to move your position extremely quickly. So in other words, once you strike that A in the middle of the second complete measure, this one right here, if I can, sorry, there it is. Yeah, so if you look at that A, you can't just play it like this because you have to be over here. 
So your practice should include this jump. And the jump has to be pretty quick. And as soon as you strike that chord, same thing. Instant jump back down. And so on and so forth. So that's pretty much the entire first page. Uh, there are no specific uh, difficult spots, I believe, uh, that need particular attention. Of course, in mm, you, you don't see it quite well here, but yeah, here in this part, this is a mezzo forte, if I remember correctly. You can't quite see it on this edition. And so you really have a strong There's a lot of this going on which you have to practice so your left or your right hand are inside the keyboard and they kind of swap uh, one after another. Let, let's also listen to how Rachmaninoff approaches this spot. Despite this mezzo forte marking, no real, uh, no real increase in dynamic. So there you have it. Uh, the printed score con contradicts what the composer wants to do. Now, granted, this was composed in 1891, uh, or no, sorry, 1893 or 92, 93 when that Rahmaninoff was basically 19 years old and the recording is from when he is you know in his mid to late 30s so um no, in fact sorry mid to late 40s so 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 his conception of the piece has already changed quite a bit quite easily after having played it so many times over and over and over perhaps he reconsidered this edition, by the way, that I'm working from was printed in 1896. So it, it would be interesting to see if there is a reprint of this piece uh, from a later date. But for right now, it kind of tells you that there are a lot of possibilities in the structuring of this first page. In fact, what he seems to be doing is giving a little more power to these bell-like uh, chords, as well as speeding up quite a bit, so he's not, you know, continuing that lento feel. There is a bit of motion uh, as we, uh, as the music arrives at this first climax, and then of course things continue. Let's see. Just switch to another view. Okay, so, yeah, 1896, you can see it. We come down to that pianissimo again. Same thing. Oh, sorry. This is a... I think there is a little bit of a passionate reaching for the top G sharp in his plane. Let, let's have a quick listen. So actually not, not so much passion in the... Right, just... And so on. Um, 
what I'm trying to say is that whatever he does, he takes time to communicate the expression behind the notes. It's not just chord, 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 chord. There's a melody connected to all those chords. And so when we go to here, notice, maybe better fingering is this. In fact, I think he voices the bottom, the left hand a little more. Maybe not. So, right, and as the music dies away towards the end, there we are presented with some possibilities, such as. The first time you can continue to bring out the top voice like Rachmaninoff seems to favor, but then that last measure you could play the same chord like this. And bringing out that cello line in the left hand. Let's see what Rachmaninoff does. Pianissimo coming up. Top line. And there's that bottom. And then we get into the next section. So Quite a few things to consider, quite a few things to practice, but um, I guess if there are some specific questions, uh, please leave them in the comments and I'll try to address them. And also let me know if you'd like me to go through the rest of this piece and look at the agitato section that's coming up on the next page. Well, I guess really next two pages, right? So all the way to the return of the theme now with these massive chords that we're all so familiar with. All right, uh, thank you.